ಹಾಗಾದ್ರೆ Hungry Wolves. Hungry Wolves. That's right. That should be like a movie, the AML Hungry Wolves. The Hungry Wolves. <laughs> the Hungry Wolves of the AML Nation. I'm going to turn my camera off because I don't want to look at anybody anymore. Turn your camera off there, everybody. Please and thank Wait, you. Wait, how do I do that? Oh, there. Whose voice is that? Bruce, this is a mess already. How so? George, look right down. At right the bottom at the bottom of your screen, George. Is this, no, Got it. There you no, go. There's no organization here. Yeah, well. Well, that's you, why. He's... You called the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> right. Never have a audio guy do a video guy's job. Just uh, saying. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay, so uh, Bruce, uh, can you tell me if this is the first podcast since the last podcast? Absolutely. Positively. It has to be there overnight. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that reminds me of our buddy George Taylor up there in Ottawa. There you go. Land of the Ottawa right. Senators. And somebody else uh, wrote in, said there's another FedEx guy out there who wrote in. Is there thing. another FedEx guy out there? Who yeah, ever... he, wrote, he, he wrote on the fans page today. Oh, okay, FedEx wow. guy. Who, all right, whoever you are, FedEx guy, make sure you send in an email so we can. Uh, that's the best way for us to take adva- uh, take notice of you, send in an email. Because <laughs> once we start reading your email, then we're like, hey, who's this guy? And then you post a lot, and then all of a sudden I start noticing, and away we go. So, That's it. so tonight we have uh, we have uh, Bruce, the moderately agitated mailboy, who's always here because the mail never stops. Because I have no life, basically. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. So no life means you come to the AML? <laughs> I have no other place to go, man. <laughs> the, I'm, I'm like, uh, this is kind of like the island of misfit toys, and this is where I belong. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Wow. Yeah, this is just getting better and better. I apologize, Kaylee. I don't think you're a misfit. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. On the Adam, on the other hand. Hey. Yeah. Adam's like the big lumberjack guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And he's okay. And he's I'm pretty a- grateful that you accept everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'd still be locked out. Uh, yeah, there you go. So we have uh, Bruce, the moderately agitated male boy. We have Kaylee uh, Zhang, who uh, single-handedly builds turbine engines and then installs them on Airbus A320s by herself. However, for a long time, she gave us the impression that sometimes she somehow she just hoisted the thing up. But we've now discovered she uses one of those scissor lift trucks and, <laughs> and, and puts it on there and then puts it in place and installs it with three bolts because apparently three bolts are stronger than four. Exactly. And it's more economical, too. Yes. Well, it would be, yeah, the price of a bolt. Yeah, and, and we and we also found out that since she's been working at home, she's been building the engines in her living room, taking them out through the front window. That's right, yeah. They yeah. weren't supposed to know that. And she loads them on one of those utility trailers from Home Depot behind her yep. Subaru, and then hauls it down to the factory and installs it. Something. That would- that would be pretty impressive if my Subaru could actually pull one. Yeah, it would be, actually. Better yet, just hook the gas line and use the engine to pull the Subaru. There you go. Ha. Ah. Ooh. There you go. Now I'm wanting something here. Yeah, yeah. You're going to need a bigger lunchbox. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then uh, we discovered on an interview we did some time ago with Dave Owens, uh, we t- discovered two things on that show. One, Dave loves the Greenberg show more than he loves Nerpum. Excuse, yes. excuse me. And uh, the second thing we discovered is that everybody in Hartford drives Subarus, which may, which might explain why Chris Adams lives in Old Saybrook, because he drives a Mustang. <laughs> 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 and then finally, we have Adam Pinellas. Speaking of Mustangs, we have Adam, our buddy Adam Pinellas, all the way from Mapleton, Utah, and he restores Mustangs as well as everything else under the sun. <laughs> One of the most talented people I know. And he's uh he's working on now he's right now his thing is brass locomotives. I wonder what his thing will be like two years from now. Did, yeah. uh, how much fun are you having with the brass locomotives? Oh man, I haven't I've been I've been praying for some type of self quarantine for a while. <laughs> <laughs> um so anyways, uh yeah, so Adam is a talent guy. Now the 
the beauty of this tonight is we're going to interview a guy uh, from Durango, Colorado. Uh, and he's a he's a play he's a goalie in a beer league in Durango, Colorado. Has nothing to do with model uh, railroading. He's just some guy that we met uh, out on the street. Now it's actually George. <laughs> it's actually George Bogatuck. Hello, guys. Uh, we're not. We haven't talked. We haven't entered. We. You're not. It's not yet, George. Go back to. Okay. The, go back to the green room, buddy. Got it. I'm out. <laughs> this is going to be a long night. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So it's George Bogatuck from Soundtracks, whose voice you just heard, and uh, we're going to ask him what would be the first question we would ask him. Anybody? I would ask him if uh, he plays goalie in the beer league. If it's like any other league, the goalie plays for free. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. All right, Adam, go down to the green room and uh, and get uh, George out of the room there, will you? I'm on my way. Hold on a second. Yeah, be careful with that first step. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Told you. <laughs> oh, ooh. Ooh. They never... Hey, George. George. Yeah. Come on yeah. up. There you are. All right. George. All right. Hang on. I'm on my way. <laughs> wow what are, these guys are this is hmm. this is and probably he does play for free if this is the kind of footwork he has <laughs> Sorry, hey, guys. Uh, hey george i found my way up here got a boy so make sure you lean into your computer because that's going to be good because the better people can hear you the more they'll enjoy your interview okay and uh so the first question we have a lot we know uh, that you're george bogatuck you work at soundtracks mm-hmm and the first question we have for you is uh, if you're a goalie in a beer league, do you play for nothing? Most cases, yes. Occasionally you get paid? Occasionally I have to pay. Um, my, uh, But it's usually not the full price of a full skater. Um, like my league, my A-league or, or level one t- team this year, um, everybody had to pay. I think it was like 250 and they told me just give 100 bucks and call it good. <laughs> So I don't, so, think, I don't think that's the kind of free we were me- meaning. We were thinking, no. we were thinking like, do you ever get paid? No. Uh, well, no, no. I was, I was thinking that uh, if it's like any other goalies, they're hard to find. So the other guys will gladly cough up his ice fees. Oh, okay. All right. That's yeah. Good. All right. And, Most cases, that's correct. Okay. So occasionally you have to pay, but uh, sometimes you don't. Correct. Okay. And are you any good? Or are you just like, are you just a... Uh, uh, a big lump of fur right there in the crease. <laughs> well, that's, I was going to add to Bruce's comment there. He said it was difficult to find goalies. I would add that qualifier good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you find good ones, you usually want to keep them around. So like my level two team, I haven't paid for that and since I joined them, I think four or five years ago. Um, so I usually don't have to worry about that. And in most tournament teams, I don't have to play. I don't have to pay for Okay, well, that's cool. Well, that adds that adds to my interest of knowing you as uh, George the goalie. Then, yeah. So you're actually you're actually sought after. Yes. You're a high draft choice. Yeah the the we were supposed to be having a uh, uh, tournament next week and it ended up getting canceled. But um, we had six goalies and I was one of the first two chosen to to be a, a goalie for it. We had six teams. And we were going to go through a draft, and each of the goalies were going to pick teams. All right. So, okay. Oh, that's an interesting way to do it. Yeah. So it was pretty fun. It was going to raise money for the local college. And like I said, it just got canceled. So. All right. Uh, uh, Adam and Kaylee don't necessarily have a lot of knowledge about hockey. Kaylee, you've never been to a hockey game. Hockey what? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> that is going to become a priority of mine is to take you to a hockey game. <laughs> and Adam, have you ever been to a hockey game? Um, I have a f- couple, uh, of like the, what are the, I guess, farm leagues. I don't know. Uh, in Salt Lake, I used to go to their beer night all the time. Okay. Uh, but neither one of you have the, have the qualifications to ask this next question. Bruce and Bruce and I have the qualifications. Bruce, I, uh, I think my next question is fair. So when I ask it, you can feel free to judge or whether it's a fair question or not. George, okay. uh, Bruce and I are, have grown up, uh, in Canada where hockey is our life. We know every. Mm-hmm. We know uh, as much about hockey. I I feel like I know as much about. It. I go to lots of Leaf games, Toronto Maple Leaf games. Uh, mm-hmm. So, uh, are you a flake like every other goalie I ever met? 
<laughs> that goes with being a goalie you have to be crazy in the head exactly uh, i actually have a t-shirt that i wear on occasion it's a it's a it's a hockey shirt it says you don't have to be crazy to play goalie but it helps yeah. <laughs> so how long so, have you, how long have you been so the other thing we got to make sure to, uh guys uh because george doesn't have a headset and he's using the mic on his computer we have to make sure that we don't talk at the same time he does because it cuts out his uh, mic. Uh, so not that anybody has done that. I will probably do it more than anybody else. Oh, we I, never talk over each other, do we? No. Ever. What? Who, no. where, where, what? Yeah. Adam, Adam, maybe, but. Yeah. Okay. Let's, we all talk at the same time? Let's get it out of the way, yeah. Get it out of the way now? Yeah, okay. yeah. We're right. Right. Well, yeah, we'll talk about it now. Yeah, so. Okay. Yeah, uh, here. <laughs> here, pass me a beer. <laughs> uh, what was the question? Wait, check the rim. Make sure it's not black on the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's let me ask. What, what's the question I was going to ask? Oh yeah. So how did you get interested in hockey, George? Well, for years and years, I'd always grown up playing soccer in some form or fashion, and always had an obsession with being goalie. But they always had another player that would always play, so I was always defenseman. But when we would play recreational, like in the backyard or whatever, I was always playing goalie, and. uh I got to the point after graduating high school and partway through college there, I got, uh, I would play indoor soccer with a bunch of guys and, and, uh, actually injured myself during one game. Um, basically dislocated my shoulder on a full extension dive. I, the insult was the guy actually scored, but popped my shoulder out and then I went and landed on it full midair. Ooh. It was Ouch. pretty sure. Um, rehabbed it, uh, went back, tried to play the first game. And it popped right back out again. And so I decided, you know what, I'm done playing soccer, at least for a while. And it ended up having the surgery and stuff like that. And what what happened was I'd always been obsessed with hockey, that stars moved to town. Because, you know, before that, there wasn't much hockey to, to do in Texas. Um, and so when the stars moved to town, I got obsessed with it, watching it all the time. And me and a buddy of mine got bored one day. So we went, we all had, we both had rollerblades. So we had some sticks from a pizza promotion uh, that I got from Stars Hockey. So we went to a uh, park, played some hockey, bought a goal and flipped it around. And we had so much fun. I went back to work and told the guys I was working with at the time. And three of them were like, oh, we play on a hockey team. We, we all do this. And so we got together a Sunday night league that would play in the parking lot across the street from our uh, store. And so we would play every Sunday night and we'd get out goals. And next thing you know, we had, you know, 15 people coming out and playing. And uh, so we basically formed a team and then uh, it took us three years to win the, the for our first game. But knowing me, I don't ever like not being the best at what I do or one of the best at what I do. So I studied, worked, worked out, you know, read, read articles, watched magazines, watched or re- watched a video, read magazines, everything I could do to learn about the position in the game and uh, worked my way up and eventually uh outgrew that team and went and started becoming sought after because I refused to just be a mediocre. And so now I'm playing in the top leagues here in Durango. And before I moved up here, I was playing in some of the top leagues back in Texas to the point where I actually played against one of Craig Ludwig's teams after his uh, retirement. And who's Craig Ludwig? Uh, the former defenseman for the Montreal Canadiens and Dallas Stars. Yeah. What's a Montreal Canadian? I have no idea of what those are. <laughs> Um, so when it's one of those Canadian teams that are listed on the cup, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, couldn't repeat. It. Uh, let repeat that for everybody because there's you're kind of cut out. Okay, I said that Montreal Canadiens are one of the Canadian teams that are listed on the Stanley Cup, yeah, a lot more than our team. Uh, so how did you where are you from? I have to apologize, yeah, you, you're gonna be doing a lot of that. Where I'm are you, sorry, where are you from? Where? Originally Dal- uh, Arlington, Texas, which is between Dallas and Fort Worth. So, how did you learn to skate? Did we learn- uh, sheer willpower? <laughs> how old were you when? You, how old were you when you started to skate? Well, let me qualify that. I had been ice skating as a kid, and we'd always gone uh, like roller skating and stuff like that. But changing to the ice and becoming regular on it, it was a little bit of a change. But uh, work at doing the parking lot hockey league that we did, uh, playing on rollerblades, you get to the you know, a little bit of skating. And in my opinion, rollerblading is a lot harder than ice skating, quite frankly. Okay. And why would that be, do you think? 
uh, because the ice has a little bit of forgiveness. Like I can turn my blade a little bit and slide along the ice. Whereas if I turn my blade as a roller blade, I'm going head over heels because the rubber wheels on the either concrete or rubber floor is going to catch and it's going to throw the weight over. Oh, okay. Interesting. So you skated as a kid somewhere in Texas and then you just. Sometimes. What's that? Uh, sometimes, sorry. Yeah, occasionally you skate. Okay, and so you had you had been uh, introduced to sk- ice skating as a kid. Then you did the rollerblading. So then you went back and taught yourself how to skate pr- uh, as best you could as an adult. That is correct. Yeah. That's pretty flaky, eh, Bruce? That's intriguing for sure. Yeah, it's intriguing. Yeah, that's right. I was trying to get the flaky part going. Go <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, so you're from Texas originally. Have you been a model? So. Were you only have you only been introduced to model railroading since you uh, have worked at Soundtracks? Let's uh, before we go on, let's make sure everybody understands. You're George Bogatuck. You work Bogatuck. You work at Soundtracks in Durango, Colorado. And what do you do there exactly? Just roughly, we'll get to it a little more in detail later. Sure, uh, I'm primarily a salesperson there, selling out to retailers and so forth, uh, doing trade shows, things like that. Okay. And uh, have you been, was this your first uh, uh, foray into model railroading or have you known of it in in the past? Uh, No, I've been a model railroader since I was 14. Um, When uh, years and years, when I was a kid, my dad had a layout in the garage, but it always became the uh, pile collector where never anything needed a place to put. It ended up being on the train layout. So it would frustrate me because I'd want to go out and play with the trains, but dad would be like, "Ah, no, I don't want to go clean it off. Well, I'll do it tomorrow or I'll clean it up next week or whatever the case was. Well, so it kind of faded off a little bit. And then um, around the age of 14, I started, uh, there was a hobby store next to the grocery store. And at that age, my mom would let me go in a little bit on my own. So I walked over to the hobby store and became friends with some of the guys there. And then when she was done grocery shopping, she'd come over, get me, pay for whatever I was buying and then go home. And uh, so I started with with uh, doing that. And the store was moving across the street a year later. And so they were looking for help. And so I asked them, well, I can help. And uh, so they were like, yeah, sure, why not? And so I basically earned my first uh, high-end locomotive at the time, which was a Concorde S- or MP15, uh, as opposed to like an, a standard Athern Blue Box, because those Concorde ones were the Cotto drives, and they had about $50 price tag on them. So, and ever since then, I've been a model railroader. And when I was working in my previous profession, which was uh, primarily auto parts, I worked at an independent store and a, and a dealership for roughly about 15, 16 years. And uh, when I got laid off from the uh, from the dealership, uh, some of the guy, I thought to myself, what do I, I want to find something I want to do, not something I have to do. Because I could have gone work the next day. I had two dealerships call me the next day saying, hey, we want you to come work. Uh, but I decided, you know what, I'm I'm OK right now. I'm going to take some time and try to find something. And if they really want me to come over, then I can work for them in two months or whatever the case was. And uh, started pursuing a career in model railroading. And Soundtracks was actually my first choice. But because I didn't live in Durango and they, I'm an unknown commodity to them. So they didn't really want to take a chance on us. You know, oh, sure. Yeah, come on up here. We'll fly up here. They uh, so I kept pestering them and sent applications all over the industry as well as doing other things to maintain some unemployment so I could have a little bit of cushion to give some uh, flexibility to find that job. And I guess I caught Nancy in a moment of weakness and she said, well, if you're in the area, uh, we can uh, talk to you. Well, that was the open door I needed. So my wife and I drove up. We went to uh, Durango, Colorado, and knocked on the door and said, I'm here. Let's talk. And she was like, I didn't know you were coming. Uh, okay. And four and a half hour later interview, uh, she sent me home with the one ad saying, look for a place to live. Wow. How cool is that? And how many years ago was that? Um, it was October of 2008. So, or, I'm sorry. I take that back. That was July of 2008. I actually moved up there in October, started working November 1st of 2008. So it's been a little over 11 years now. So you basically uprooted your whole life and moved to Durango, Colorado. Pretty much. How old were you when you started working at uh, at Soundtracks? Let me do the bat math backwards. About 35, okay. 34, around there. Okay. So, so I started working in the parts industry at 18, right out of high school. It's, okay, the parts industry. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask them, as always. Don't, you know, don't, you don't have to be quiet because of me. We just need to, all the thing we have to do is just to make sure we don't talk over George. We can talk over each other. 
We just can't talk over George. Uh, yeah, that's right. Forget it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what it is, Bruce or Adam. What is it about microphones that aren't headsets that wear their, uh, or Kaylee, obviously, they're like their Vox uh, <laughs> microphones where they, they have a tendency that when you cut talk over them, they cut out. What is that? Anybody? Science. Science. <laughs> Science, yeah. Is that what that is? Is that what you call Science. it? <laughs> is that what you call Good that? <laughs> Science. Adam, figure that out for us. Well, you can get back to us by the end of the show. How does a Vox? Because that's a Vox microphone, isn't it? Where it's voice activated? Nothing. <laughs> Come on, you guys. You can't expect me to be yeah, asking. Yeah, Vox is voice activated. It's like on the uh, the family radios we sometimes use for... Uh, operating you can either use push button or vox on them and of course the famous one was on apollo 13 when the the lads were on vox bitching and whining and uh somebody uh finally pointed out that uh, they were on vox <laughs> and uh so vox is probably it's probably the early kind of microphone where somebody's going to write in on email and tell us about this um we certainly hope so yeah we certainly hope so whoever you are <laughs> start writing now before the end of the show um <laughs> Uh, so this is my, how it must have been how Ten Four and Roger and all that kind of came about is because if the person didn't wait till the other person stopped talking, it would be a constant mishmash of what did you say? Is that probably a good uh, good analogy? No, I think the the Ten Four and all that started so that whoever you were talking to knew you were done, and then they could start. Ah, uh, okay. Because Roger and stuff, it goes it goes way back to the. You know, the early days of radio and communications, the guys in World War II, the over and out type stuff, you know. So they would do what they say and say over. Then the other guy knew it was free for him to talk. Okay. This show has been brought to you by the the letter K and the number 18. So, George, did you ever take any time off, uh, like, as uh, uh, for, for girls in cars in your late teen years, like a lot of people do from model railroading? Not really. Um, I'd always stayed modeling in some form or fashion. Um, my ex-wife tolerated it for, for lack of a better term. Um, and then, uh, uh, my, my current wife, uh, forever. <laughs> you know, we had somebody else say that once and his life, his life kind of just went downhill from there. Yeah. I think what you mean to say is your lovely wife that you're married to now, not your current wife, like as if you're making changes. <laughs> right. Well. <laughs> Her her uh, father was actually a model railroader, so um, model railroading isn't necessarily the biggest thing to to score with the ladies. And so it wasn't the first thing I brought up when I met her. Um, the The cool thing is, I actually met her in a hockey store. She was working there part time, and I went in to buy new gear. And so we had that connection because she had an aff affinity for hockey. And uh, so we went out on our first date. I was a little nervous uh, even mentioning it, and. Um, I was kind of sidestepping the subject a little bit. And then finally it came out to the point where it, she started getting nervous. And finally I was like, all right, fine. It's a model train. And she was like, oh, my dad does that. What scale do you work in? It was like, oh, crap. Do I need to buy you the ring now or do we have to go through? Uh, <laughs> you know? So, uh, so your wife and your wife's name is, did you say Chrissy? Is that right? Yes. Yep. Chrissy. Yeah. Um, so does she have a particular team she roots for? Uh, well, she was in Dallas when the stars came around and because she worked part-time at the store, they used to have events for star, uh, signing autographs for the, some of the younger kids and some of the, you know, not like Mike Madonna, but, uh, when Brendan Morrow first jumped into the league, him and Turco were at a signing event at the store and Turco was still this untested, uh, unproven backup to Eddie. And, uh, so they could do that, those kind of thing, events at the store and get people in and buy equipment and buy T-shirts and stuff like that. And so she had that she knows some of those or knew some of those players at the time because of the affinity with the store. Um, but I didn't know her at that point. Um, but we were both there because, of course, I went over. I knew the store owner and we just didn't meet because we weren't ready to meet each other yet. And then uh, come to find out this other time, about a year and a half later, I came in to buy the equipment and met her and, you know, the rest is history. So uh, for her, I would say stars. Um, I think there's a little bit of Kings, mostly just because of Jonathan Quick. Um, I think he's probably one of the best goaltenders in the league. Um, beyond that, we do have an affinity for Leafs Nation. I will tell you that um, I became a Leafs fan more when Eddie came to Toronto. So 
All right. How about the AML Nation? Any any affinity for that? Of course. Atta boy. Uh, there you go. Good answer. Yeah. So should <laughs> should I get smart the, answer? Yeah. Uh, Adam, you're being awful quiet. It's making me nervous. Oh, I'm just trying to. I'm taking notes about hockey. Atta boy. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, George, should I get the story about Springfield out of the way now, or you want me to save it till later? I'll go ahead and knock it out. I'm so embarrassed by this. <laughs> go ahead. So, at Springfield, Bruce, you're aware of this. Kaylee, you're aware of this. I end up running around trying to interview as many people as I can, and you end up saying hi to people as you're going by. So, George and I have become fast friends over the last three or four years because of hockey and because he's just a good guy. And uh, so I'm going down the aisle. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm passing soundtracks. And George is there, and he gives me a big wave, and I wave back. And then he holds up this really cool Dallas Stars toque. And I'm like, oh, how cool is that? So I walk over, and he says, yeah, look at this toque. And he he hands it to me. So I put it on, and we have our picture taken with it on and everything. And I'm thinking, how cool is this? George has brought me a Dallas Stars toque. And I'm thinking, that is so cool. So then, you know, I figure, well, I'll I'll walk away wearing this thing to show appreciation. So I start to take about four steps out of the soundtracks booth. And he says, hey, where are you going? That's my hat. And I'm like, ooh. Now, let me me qualify this. Speaking of this. Yeah. Let me qualify this. Uh, I'm sitting in there talking to a customer, and I see him walking by. This is Friday afternoon, I think it was. Friday evening or late Saturday. I forget what it was, but I was talking to a customer. I saw him walking by. So I waved to him and I had my hat in the hand because we were getting ready to leave. And he came over and I thought he was putting on, putting it on to take a picture of it to show that he's a part-time Dallas stars fan, which we can always explore with him anytime. And, uh, and then, so I was like, all right, this will be cool. Get a picture of, you know, captain uh, Toronto Maple Leafs there in a stars hat. And, then I was like, wait, hold on a minute. That's not what I meant. <laughs> and I would, have, I would have given it to you if I had another one with me that weekend. So do you always carry around a Dallas Stars toque in your hand or what's the deal with that? Oh, we're getting ready to leave. Oh, okay. And you were now, gonna... now, now, can, can I step in here? Yes, please. Could you? You and I were down in Springfield that week and I'm assuming the same when George was there. Yeah. It wasn't all that cold, I yeah. thought. Yeah, it was like 40 like, degrees out. Like, really? You need a toque at 40 degrees? Come on. Yeah, and he lives in Durango in the mountains, so it must get cold yeah, there. That all. gets colder there. Yeah. So you want to... So I, I think he just had second thoughts and said, no, 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 I don't want to really give that to you. Yeah, exactly. You want to try again, George? You want to try it for a different explanation? It's dry in Durango. <laughs> we have a humidity of about 5 to 10, 15%. In uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, it's like 75 to 100 percent. It it feels a whole lot colder out there. If it's 40 degrees here and the sun's out, I can go outside in a T-shirt. Oh, man, we're not getting that. Oh, boy, if it's uh, if it's uh, if it's 10 below zero, it's a great day here because we have no humidity. But if it's 40, come on, George. I'll uh, (laughs) I'll, I'll back him up on that because when we were running our Saskatoon office, uh, we didn't do a lot of work in the winter out there because it was kind of cold. Uh, so a couple of a couple wait a of minute, guys, wait a minute. A couple, tie, no, tie. a couple of our guys would come to our Barry office, and they always complained about feeling a lot colder in Barry than in uh, Saskatoon. And the same thing. I spent a lot of time in the winter in Saskatoon, and minus thirty in Saskatoon does not feel as cold as minus thirty in Barry because of the humidity. Uh, Kaylee, when were we having that discussion about uh, engineers? I was having that discussion with Dave Abelis about <laughs> engineers. All right, we yeah, were, I was gonna say it wasn't with me. Yeah, we were doing great there, Bruce, until you had to back them up with facts. <laughs> this is the, there's no part of the AML uh, uh, experience that is really based in facts. Let's try, let's try try to remember that going forward. Okay, George. So all right, so you uh, you moved. To, so what were you were you model railroading between the time between eighteen and by time by the time you got to Durango, what was the model railroading that was happening in between those two? From that, uh, go ahead. A whole lot of learning. Um, I was modeling and and uh, being active. I was been part of several modular railroad groups. I still keep in touch with a lot of those guys I mentioned that I met at the hobby store. Um, a few of those guys are still my friends. I talk to on a regular basis today, um, but. Uh, they basically were teaching me the way to do things, you know, how to lay track, how to build bench work, how to wire the layout. And of course, all the advancements in technology. Um, the last model train club I was a part of, 
Um, I kind of joined partially because my wife's father passed and we inherited his HO and HON3 stuff. And that was about the time Blackstone actually announced their first K-27. And uh, I said, well, Chrissy, we have to buy a, mo- a locomotive to really honor your father and carry his stuff around the layout. And she kind of said, OK, so we got it. And I joined a train club that had HO and HON3 stuff. So I would run my standard gauge stuff on the on the main layout. And these are the 50 to 60 car cold trains, the, you know, the 30, 45 uh, car grain trains and, and, you know, big boys, passenger trains, all that kind of stuff. And then I had the narrow gauge stuff to run some smaller trains and slower speed. And so I do had I learned to appreciate and under and, and have an affinity for that narrow gauge. And so when I actually got laid off, some of the guys in my train club had actually been accusing me of being on the payroll at Soundtracks because I was one of the quote unquote DCC guru guys that figured out how to run a train. And so everybody came to me with questions. And a lot of times, you know, they would buy these, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, uh, entry level sound systems or, or economy systems. Yeah, something like that. But it was some of the factory installed ones that came in early on that weren't soundtracks products. And they were trying to find out what was going on with them. And some of the times it basically amounted to, well, you can't do that because it's not a soundtracks product. And they used to accuse me of being on the payroll. So when I got laid off, I was like, you know what? I do really appreciate their decoders. They work well. They're reliable. And you know what? I like the technology part of it. I kind of have, you know, an interest in that. So why not? Everybody makes, you know, there's a lot of people that make a living in this model railroad industry. Why not me too? So that was what spearheaded the idea to go after a job in the model railroad hobby. Uh, so how did you, how, uh, do you just have a natural affinity for figuring out the DCC and electronics and that sort of stuff? Well, I, I go back a lot farther. When I was a kid, my dad bought me, a, a it was a Radio Shack beginner circuit kit. And I think every kid in the United States should have one of these. But it was a small little projects bay at box that had resistors and little spring-loaded clips. And they would show you all these different circuits to, to design. So you, I could make a radio out of it. I could illuminate numbers on a uh, LCD screen um, and things like that, that I – I was like, okay, so that gave me at least a basic understanding of how electricity works. It flow. My, my dad always told me it flows like a river, it has a starting and a stopping point. Anything in between, if it breaks up, it's not a circuit. Um, and so having a little bit of that with the model railroading interest, and they were actually the first one that I wore down enough to give me to open the door to let me come in. And so I, I, I obviously went there with my first choice. And while I was uh, while I was waiting for for Nancy to actually fill out the position, put it in and put a salary to it, I actually got a call from another company. Uh, hey, you know what? We'd like to interview you. And so they actually flew me out to their place, interviewed with them, came home, and I still felt good about my decision to stay with Soundtracks. And I'm standing by that. Okay, so we won't ask you what the other company is. Obviously, you don't want to mention it. But so how did all how did these companies know of you that? that they want, wanted to, like, did you have some sort of, uh, 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 were you known in the hobby as a, as a DCC guy or something? Nope. Just some spare modeler that uh, happened to send applications out and trying to create a position for himself, basically. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so, and what were you modeling? What did you have? Like, to, had you started a layout or anything before you got to soundtracks or anything like that? Oh, yeah. I had a two car garage with a layout in there that had uh, removable sections so I could put a car in the garage. And then when I pulled the car out, I could move the sections around. It had wheels and everything was leveled and, and set up and it had bolts to hold everything together to make sure the track lined up and everything fit into a basically a movable cart. And so I could still run, like, say, the yard, and the industrial area without the layout being connected. But then if I needed to run the uh the whole lay- the whole loop so to speak i had to put the extra sections in um and that was one of many different layouts i had um i remember my first apartment in the bedroom i'd built a layout above the bed and everything on the walls so it was like a foot and a half wide uh basically like 60 inches from the ground around so that i could still lay down on the bed and um have my clothes dressers and and all the furniture in there but it was up high enough that it didn't interfere with any of that and, you know, 
So I would, I would built iterations of different layouts before, you know, at that point there was guys like David Barrow and had built the modular Domino style layouts and things like that. So I was trying to build layouts like that, that potentially could double as a modular layout sometime down the line. And were you doing any operating in anything or were you, the, the, you said you were with a club in the Dallas area, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Most of it was roundy round, uh, running trains, um, you know, loop model, loop running. The modular club, of course, goes to displays, whether it be at train shows. And we had a deal in Plano, I think it was, where we would set up for Christmas time and we'd start the weekend before Thanksgiving. And then, as long as we had volunteers there on the weekends and in the evenings, um, they gave us the space. And it wasn't every weekend. I mean, every every night it was you know certain nights, but we had to have volunteers there. But they gave us the space to set up for like a month and a half. And basically run trains for the guests as they came through the Christmas village. Oh, that's, um, that's cool. So, Go ahead. so that type of operation is really more what I was in. Um, we built some layout, some of my layout at home for operation, but it never really materialized much uh, beyond running around in circles. Um, and so when I moved to Durango, my first layout built here in the house was actually a, a loop layout where I could run trains, at least get something running with operation kind of thrown in around inside the loop. And then I started learning a lot more about like real railroad operations, of course, trying to show how the uh, soundtrack tsunami and now the tsunami two both mimic the work that the real railroads do. And so I got a lot more interested in real railroading with uh, actual brake applications and, and um, other sounds and things like that. And so the new layout is designed with nothing but operation in mind where I basically take a train out of the yard, go operate, run an industrial area turn, uh, drop cars off, pick cars up and take them back to the yard. And then the yard will build them up and send them out to the staging yard. Oh, cool. So what do you, mo- what's your uh, railroad do you model? So what I focus on is 1978 Missouri Pacific and the layout that I plan to build at some point down the line is going to be a, uh, Southern Missouri, Northern Arkansas, known as the White River Route. It was uh, two subdivisions, uh, Carthage Sub and the Cotter Sub. And they basically went from uh, Kansas City down to uh, Little Rock. Okay. And part of the reason I like that particular section of the of the railroad was because if you look at a lot of the scenery pictures from that section of the railroad, it's a lot of like what you would expect to see in the Rocky Mountains. Um, and to get out of Kansas city, they had to go up over what's called independence Hill to get onto the subdivision out of Kansas city. And a lot of times you'd see some uh, trains, coal trains with six, seven units on it. And so it's like, well, uh, model, it's modeling the Missouri Pacific. You've got great mountainous type scenery and big, heavy, long trains with a lot of power. You can't beat that type of a railroad. The problem is I don't have the space here at the house, at the house I currently live in. Uh, we're renting right now. Um, to build something like that. And even still, it would have to be a lot more modular and it would only be a partial representation. So I just decided to go with this to give me something to play with for the time being. And then if, and when we're ever, ever able to build a, uh, uh, or buy a big house with a decent space, then I can go in and start building that section. But in the meantime, I've been collecting equipment and rolling stock and uh, locomotives and stuff like that. So once that's built, I'm ready to go. So the the current house you're in with your current wife? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Smart guy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think anybody accused me of that too much. Um all right. So and I remember you guys if you have questions, but he's kinda he's interesting to listen to, isn't he? Oh, Absolutely. Yeah. Now I actually do have a question. All right, sure. go for it. So, George, how do you find a balance between working um, in your day job, which is predominantly dealing with model railroads, and then coming home to work on your own model railroad? Do you find that to be a challenge, or do you find that to be um, how do you, how do you balance the, the the that the that stress, if you will? It's it's definitely a challenge. There's a lot of times I come home and think, you know what, I'm not going to touch my trains because I don't care. Um, but at the same time. I'm able to separate it because I had, if, if I was working any job, I'd have to be selling a widget of some kind. And so for me, when I'm working at the day, most of the time when I'm talking to either to retailers or stuff like that, I'm dealing with part numbers and uh, circuit board formats. Um, these guys are businessmen, so they're more interested in, in the part numbers and the return, the costs and stuff like that. Um, and then when I talk to to end users and stuff like that during the day, 
I try to talk to them like I'm talking to my friends uh, because a, I'm going to be a lot more patient with people. Number two is I'm going to give them the information because I'm listening to what's important to them. So I can answer that question. And then to a certain extent, I can throw on basically the modeler hat and say, you know, we're buddies in this hobby and in this industry, let's talk and let's answer your questions so that that way you can enjoy your hobby the best. Um, and so, you know, when I'm done the day of the work, depending on on what's going on, because I mean, it is still work. And so there's numbers, there's deadlines, there's quotas, uh, goals, things like that. Um, so I try not to let that interfere too much with the uh, personal railroading, because um, when I come home, I can come home and do a decoder installation. Uh, or one day, like last weekend, I was actually installing a bunch of uh, the Woodland Scenics just plug lighting yard lights over the rail yard in my on my layout just to light it up. So at some point, I can do night operations too. Um, so there's a lot of balance. It's it is difficult, I will say, but ultimately, if you enjoy what you do. Um, you don't really work. So I that put myself into that category because I can, you know, like I said, when I'm talking to customers with questions and problems, I talk to them like they're my buddies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I have firsthand experience with that because I know George, you and I have conversed a few times at Springfield, but also a few times because of my capacity at Tom's trains. Mm -hmm. um, you've uh, Every time I reached out to you, you've always been right on top of things, right on top of getting me an answer. Um, even if you didn't really have the answer right away, you said, I'll, let me check with my engineering department and I'll get back to you. So mm -hmm. really appreciate that. And I just want to publicly say that on the air. Oh, good. Thank you. Did he ever offer to give you a hat and then take it back? <laughs> he didn't even offer me anything. So, oh, yeah, well, well, it's probably better because uh, you can't even imagine how I felt as I was walking away. <laughs> he, he's doing his best to make sure I feel that way every day when he mentions it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I got a question for you, George. Um, what do you? You seem very passionate about the hobby, and we talked to lots of people that are passionate about the hobby. Adam, of course, is a conductor on the California Zephyr, and he's passionate. And Kaylee's been passionate about the hobby forever, and she's con she's either working at Tom's Trains, or she's building a layout, or she's the nutmeg girl, or she's the photo uh, contest chairman for the Northeastern Division. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So w what do you think it is about model railroading for those that like it? What do you think it is about it that makes people so passionate about it? There's so many different facets to it. Um, one of, you know, the, I, I hate to quote this, but you know, I mean, it is the world's greatest hobby because you have to be a carpenter, an electrician, an artist, because I mean, we're painting, we're, we're sculpting, uh, scenery, we're making trees and stuff like that. Um, and then there's a certain level of being a railroad historian. If you're trying to model something accurately, um, you have to be a, uh, mechanically inclined if you're tuning up a, a locomotive or something like that you have to be able to lay track and so there's a little mechanical incl inclination needs to be there as well i mean and there, there's so many different aspects of it that you can actually be focused and and you know a friend of mine told me once upon a time he said he does something every night on his railroad whether it's just drilling a hole the idea is that the, the progress gets there and with model railroad excuse me with model railroading you can do something completely different and still be making progress on your layout. One day you could be uh, making rock work and the next day you could be painting a locomotive and you're doing completely different things, even though they're all working towards that same goal. Um, but for me, you know, personally, my enjoyment is, you know, the railroading, the operations, um, you know, the bench work and, and stuff like that is kind of a necessary thing. I don't really enjoy building the bench work, but I, I know how to do it and can do it well. But, I like the playing with it basically, which is, you know, the operations. And so, um, you know, you can do different aspects of it. And that's what I think is so great is it unites so many different people from different backgrounds and different interests that we can all enjoy the same hobby, even though we have different approaches to it. Yeah, exactly. It draws so many people together. You're being awful quiet, Adam. Uh, I'm just, I'm listening. This is great. You're soaking it all in, buddy. I am. I am. I'll take the quiz after. All right. Okay. All right. Fair enough. That's fair enough. Uh, okay, George. Uh, let's get right to the your favorite subject. So, how how many people are in Durango? What's the population of Durango? I do not. I do not believe the population of Durango would fill up Leafs Stadium or Leafs uh, whatever they call it. My brain just went blank. The Air Canada Center. Right. Uh, and don't say anything, Bruce. Uh, 
uh, they actually changed it. It's now it's always going to be the Air, the ACC, the Air Canada Center, and and one of the local banks took over the sponsorship, thinking that people are going to call it that, and they never will. Um, no. Um, so okay, <clears throat> one thing. Well, this will be my last hockey question. So, if the town is only like eight, seventeen, or eighteen thousand, or fifteen thousand people, or whatever it is. How how is it that you are? There's so much hockey going on in that town. It's a pretty small town for the amount of hockey you're playing. Uh, yes, and I've asked myself that a lot. But we have a really really strong hockey community. Um, it's actually run by the city. But now, when I've mentioned the the population around seventeen eighteen thousand of people in Durango, there's a lot more that live out in the county beyond. So we draw. Uh, people from Farmington, New Mexico, which is just across the border, uh, Pagosa Springs, which is about 45 minutes east of us, um, some of the areas around there. Uh, one of my good buddies, he's one of my goalie guys that uh, him and I are head to head a lot, but he's a really good friend of mine. Uh, he drives all the way over from Monticello, uh, Utah hmm. to play. So that's an hour and a half drive to play a game and to hang out in the parking lot afterward, uh, do the proverbial beard league uh hang out afterward and then he drives home so when we're playing at 10 30 at night he's driving home about one two in the morning so wow and you said uh, yeah you want to go ahead go ahead bruce uh 2017 the population of durango area was eighteen thousand four hundred and sixty five. okay so, so it would not so it would not fill scotia bank place no or the acc nor the acc uh <laughs> So you said nor, nor nor the Sky Dome, nor the Sky Dome, no, uh, and we don't care about where the Ottawa Senators play or the Montreal. Exactly. Um, Who are they? Go ahead, George. Who are they? There you go. Now you're getting it. So is that uh, you said you mentioned P- uh, Pagosa Springs? Is that downtown Pagosa Springs? <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> Uh, George, uh, Bruce got it. <laughs> yes, yes, I did. I, I was thinking the same thing, Chris. Here, I could work that in, but you beat me to it. <laughs> okay, I got it now. There you go. Uh, and where do they pass through? Where's the other place they start out and they go through down, but they end up in downtown Pagosa Springs. Wolf Creek Pass. Wolf Creek Pass, exactly. Way upon the Great Divide, trekking on down the other side. There you go, exactly. Uh, for those yeah. of you who have no idea what we're talking about, C.W. McCall with a song, Wolf Creek Pass. Uh, okay, so let's get to your favorite subject then, soundtracks. How long, and you've been there 12 years, and what do you do exactly there? So what I do is primarily sales. Um, I do a little bit of everything, quite frankly, but um, I spend a lot of time on the phone with retailers, letting them know of new products, new announcements, uh, making sure they're placing their orders because uh, a lot of these are small businesses, and trying to run a small business that usually pulls you in about eight different directions. And so uh, placing their, their stocking orders isn't necessarily their first concern, obviously taking care of the customers, making sure the hours are there, the bills are paid, things like that. So by calling them, it kind of rattles the cage a little bit, says, hey, you know, you might want to you know place an order. It's been a couple months. And they go, oh, really? I didn't realize it's been that long. And then they run a report and look, oh, wow, I need a lot of stuff. All right. You know, whatever the case is, um, that's the primary part of it. Um, I also do a lot of trade shows which is one of my favorite parts of it. Again, getting out and meeting the model railroaders, getting to travel to the different areas, uh, see different layouts, got to go to Adam's place, which was fun and exciting. Um, And uh, so I get to do that. And like I said, that's one of my favorite parts of it. It takes a lot out of you because they're long days, but they are fun to do. Um, I've also helped out with uh, like specking out products where they'll, we'll have a new product idea and I come at it from the model railroader aspect uh, having that experience and the discussions with guys being able to say, hey, you know, this is a product we need. Um, let's build the design. Like when we built the Tsunami 2, uh, I was in a lot of those meetings trying to decide how does this work and what does it look like so that our engineers could then go to work and make it. Um, and that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that project or that uh, process. Um, I've also done shipping. I've done production work downstairs, helping build and test, uh, excuse me, helping test decoders and and building packaging product. Um, basically there isn't many jobs in there that I haven't done, uh, helped out with support. I do that a lot, uh, except running the CEO job. That's one I've haven't done. <laughs> you really like it though. You really like your job, don't you? I do. It's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. And ultimately it delivers happiness to people than model railroading because they're getting a cool product that basically is their toys. I mean, this is what they do for fun. And so, 
it, it's definitely a different approach for people coming over to me and talking to me about soundtracks than they used to when they talk about auto parts. Uh, when their car's broken down and it's going to cost them money they didn't plan on. And, you know, now they can't just buy this little spring. They got to buy this whole assembly because that's the way it's designed and things like that. It was always the the parts guy was always the scapegoat. And so it's definitely a different attitude of people coming and talking to you. Yeah. And you're laughing there. You're 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 not you're what do you do? You're chuckling there, uh, Kaylee. What are, you, what are you thinking? Well, the parts guys always get beat up for um, for, quote unquote, upselling everything. So. I could totally appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, all, mm-hmm. right. all right. So, uh, uh, what's the what's that guy in Colorado? What's or in Utah? What's his name? The big guy, you know, the big guy, the big bald guy. A- A- Adam. Yeah, that guy. Uh, Adam, you must have a question you want to ask uh, George about uh, soundtracks. Um, not right offhand. I've I use I I talk to George pretty often. So uh, if it's not George, I talk to his uh, his partner Josh. Um, I I can make up a question maybe. No, I got I got I'm fine. I can keep going. Uh, which right. which direction are which direction should we ta- be talking to him about as far as soundtracks? What's which uh, direction would be the best? How many employees do they have there, George? Uh, we're right around twenty employees, and about half of them work downstairs on the production floor, and the other half work upstairs, whether it be engineering, accounting, in my department, sales, Josh's department, support, and then of course Nancy and CEO and stuff like that. So. All right, so that's a that's a re- and they and that they've been there for how long have they actually been in Colorado? Uh, in Colorado, it's been almost fifteen years, maybe twenty years. I don't remember now. My brain went blank. All right, uh, but the company itself is thirty years old this yeah. year. Yeah, and how many shows do you do a year? Uh, that'll vary a little bit. Um, I've done as few as four or five to as many as I think last year was one of our busiest. I think I ended up doing 10 or 11 different shows over the year. And how do you decide which shows to go to? Uh, we sit down as a committee. We look at the costs of the show, where the area of the show is, like if it's an area we don't get to very often. Um, we look at the demographics and, and just say, OK, does this look like something we want to do? And then uh, some of the other demographics are what other stores are in the area that we could expand and get the most bang for your buck. So this is where we look and see, OK, is there a store we can go by and visit and do a clinic? Um, is there a uh, club nearby that we can go in and do a clinic? Is there stuff like that that we can do um, to really get expand, expand the cost uh, or get the most for your cost? Um, you know, this past year, we've been doing a lot more of the railroad prototype meets, the RPMs, um, because these guys are, I mean, are a lot of the more serious modelers. Um, they, of course, attract people from all across the spectrum, but for the most part, they're known to be the, 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 the serious guys. And you're less likely to get the families out on a Sunday outing to walk through. You're going to get the people who have that interest in model trains. And of those guys, you've got the ones that have the interest and so, for lack of a better term, we get to go out there and talk to and influence the influencers of our hobby. You know, these are the the high end modelers that go back home to whatever town they live in and show everybody their cool models. And then, if you know, they say, you know what, you really guys should try this soundtracks products. You know, I talked to George and he told me about this, this, and this. And it's really cool. You need to try it out. And those guys will go back up and try it out because the guy who's the the you know, for lack of a better term, the top model railroader in the area is telling them to do this, then yeah, they should probably look at it and think about it. Okay. Well, you've been in a, I'm going to ask you my favorite million dollar question. I don't know if I've ever asked you this. I may have asked you in one of the times I interviewed you along the way, but uh, you've been part of the hobby now for ever for, since you were 14 and you've mm-hmm. been, you've been, uh, you went out and found yourself a job. You're having a, you enjoy the hobby. You travel all over. Is the hobby growing? I think it's growing in different ways. Um, the The hard part is a lot of people look at it as hobby shops are going out of business. And so therefore the hobby must be dying. And we look at our clientele and they tend to be a lot of older people. Um, you know, after the kids are gone, they can now actually spend time on their own interests as opposed to having to work a job, raise a family, things like that. And so I, I tend to see it as growing in a different way because we've got a lot more technology out there and, Things like this, for example, I mean, the Internet gives us such an unlimited reach. And there's a lot of people who don't go to the hobby stores that are online. 
um, you know, I meet them all the time at the shows and, and they may not necessarily go to their local stores because they're afraid of being, uh, you know, younger kids, for example, afraid of being looked down by the, the, the experienced modelers and stuff like that. And so they tend to live online, learn that stuff online. I mean, there's plenty of uh, young kids doing stuff like YouTube channels, uh, doing some incredible weathering and things like that, that you can find on YouTube. And so, but I don't know that I've ever seen those people at the shows. And part of it is, you know, you kind of alluded to it earlier when you've got a younger uh, demographic where you've got girls and cars and all the different other interests. I just see it growing differently. And, and, you know, and, and especially with as way the hobby is growing and, and all the innovations and, and things that the manufacturers are putting into their products, whether it be Athern or or whoever with, uh, you know, new details and new levels of, of stuff like that, that really help push the envelope. And it just makes this hobby grow so much more and people get more excited about the new stuff. And that's what drives our hobby is buying and they're buying the products. So, you know. All right. So, okay. So uh, you, you talked about, uh, so does soundtracks have a plan? I mean, aside from being on the best podcast on the planet for model railroading, does soundtracks have a, the soundtracks, do you guys have meetings about, okay, how can we utilize the, the social media to make our, our company grow and to get our product out there? Or, or are you, are you, you're, you know, you're still doing the shows. Is it, do you feel like it's a combination of everything or? It's a it's multifaceted attack, just like you said. I mean, uh, we we do a weekly video on our YouTube channel where we post a new short little three to five minute video highlighting a particular feature of our decoders. Uh, one day we may talk about the F11 brakes and how it works. The next day we'll talk about uh, dynamic exhaust and what that is and what that means. Then the next day we'll talk about how to select the air horn. And the next day we'll talk about something else and all kinds of different aspects, you know, and so we keep that pushing because we, once you subscribe and you've got regular occurrences, people know, OK, I know Saturday I'm going to get my new soundtracks video. So sometime over the weekend, I got to watch my video. Um, and then we also do a, a series of webinars that we post live online during the day. And then they're archived and posted on our YouTube channel and on our website. And that goes all kinds of topics. For example, we the first ones we did were from the aspect of. OK, maybe you're not as familiar with Soundtracks products and what they can do. So here's a 35, 40 minute overview of steam decoders. Then the next one is uh, diesel decoders. And then just, OK, well, now I get the overview. What do we do with it? Well, then we did one with operation. All right. Well, now you're sold. OK, show me what else you got, George. All right. So next we started with what is DCC starting from the very beginning? You know, how does DCC work? Because that's a very big mystery. A lot of people don't understand it. Uh, Cause it's sending digital. And, and the reason is, is because you can't see the digital signal the train should be moving. It's not moving. Why isn't it moving? So we can go backwards, but if we do a digital signal and my train isn't moving, it's harder to find out why. And so we talk a little bit about what is DCC kind of show the, the little green man behind the curtain and what he's doing um, all the way up to, you know, what is audio? What's the science of, of sound and how does it work? And, um, then we did one, how to solder. We basically did a whole session just to teach you how to solder. And these webinars are designed from our classes that we held in Durango, Colorado to teach everybody basically how to use the products. It started as a dealer training, uh, for retailers to come out and learn so they could go back and teach their customers. Um, but then the last two years we did it and we haven't done it in a couple of years, but the last two years we opened it up to the end user to come out and actually spend the weekend with us and do the same classes basically, but it, fr from a uh, end user perspective, as opposed to a, a retailer perspective. And so, you know, we try to do that. Um, we also are active on Facebook. Uh, we do some, um, you know, product giveaways and things like that to where, uh, you know, try to get the engagement up, try to have people engage, you know, send us pictures. We try to keep uh, topics out there and keep that uh, uh, channel relevant and then we do have Instagram and I'm not, I don't think we do that as much as we probably should. And then we have our electronic newsletter. So we try to get out there as much as we can to show everybody um, what we offer because, you know, what I have in my decoder may be something like, say, for example, Bruce, you may think is the most important thing, but I haven't advertised it to a certain aspect. And so you come up to me at shows or online and you say, hey, what does your decoder do 
you know, this. And I can say, yes, this is how you do it. And then that's the most important thing to you. So now you're like, oh, wow, it does do that. Um, and all the time we've been doing the tsunami, too, I've only been asked for two things it can't do. And what are they? Uh, they are they're written down on a piece of paper in the engineering department. <laughs> <laughs> Not to be kind. OK, here's a, a question for you. Uh, well, obviously, Actually, obviously, you do a lot of uh, uh, selling to people who are putting their own decoders in locomotives and things like that. You also do work with manufacturers. Uh, say manufacturer X comes to you saying, I'm going to bring out uh, uh, Pekaloka uh, GP20. What do you do to work with that manufacturer to get a, uh, uh, a sound tracks uh, decoder that will uh, give you all, <laughs> no pun intended, bells and whistles of a GP20? So the first thing is, is we need to look at what they're looking for. Are they looking for a custom board design or are they going to use an off the shelf design? Like, say, for example, um, nowadays with the 21 pin being uh, pretty popular and used regularly, um, if a manufacturer has a 21 pin motherboard, then great, we can use an off the shelf. But like, say, for example, Athern Genesis uses their own unique GN2208, uh, which is a, a custom built decoder that's pre-regulated for LEDs and drops right into their uh, mounting uh, uh, hardware in the model and, so, and fits their footprint. So first we need to look at that and then kind of cost it out. And once we agree to all that stuff, then we say, okay, what model are you working on? And let's use your Jeep 20 as an example. So the first thing we would do is say, okay, well, we can select these prime movers to be in there defaulted to the six, uh, 567 turbo. Then we say, okay, well, you're going to do this in six road names. Let's look at the road names and are you doing, you know, road name specific air horns? Okay, well, then we can go through and separate the part numbers to predetermine which air horn plays when the customer opens the box and puts it on the track so that it matches the model. And that's when we go through and we give them basically a few decoders to kind of play with and set up the way they want it. They give us those CD values and, and the sound selections. When we custom program a decoder, uh, that they can then go through and test in their model to sign off on it. And once we agree to, okay, this is the profile, this is the CV settings, this is where they do things like volume settings, equalizer, brakes, whatever you know, buttons they want to control, what sound effects, et cetera. Once that's signed off, then our engineering, I mean, our production department then gets to work and they start collecting the parts, order the raw boards, get them into production, and we build them downstairs. And even for those guys, all, every single one of those decoders are hand tested as are our aftermarket decoders. And so we hand test even the production runs for guys like Athern, put them in the box, and then we ship them to their fact, their offices here. And then they forward them to the shipment uh, to the company overseas that builds them uh, because it has to do with the export import paperwork. And because it's in their possession and they're going to re import it, there's some special way they have to do the paperwork. So um, but that's kind of ultimately the the very very nutshell version of the the life of a decoder from project to finished product. And and typically, how long might that take? Obviously, it's going to vary depending on what the manufacturer is looking for. But we're talking this is a, a year long thing, two three months. Uh, what type of time frame? Two to three months is probably fair. If we have to do a raw board design, I mean, we already have the circuitry designed in house for our tsunami twos. Basically, then they say, well, we, this is our footprint. And we just basically rearrange the components and the traces to fit in that. Um, our decoders are four-layer circuit boards. So they they are designed four layers. And then our engineers, once they get it, they prototype it. We usually get those. Once those boards are designed, the prototypes show up in about a week, week and a half. Then we run them through the machines and populate the components on there, test everything out, run it through the ringers, make sure it works. And when it works, then we send them versions of it for test fitting and, and so forth into the into the finished model. So I think three months from a, hey, we need to build this decoder uh, to finished product is probably fair. Um, usually, if we have an off the shelf design or something like that, we could probably turn it around in a month and a half. Yeah. And uh, sounds, you, you mentioned you have various uh, prime movers and uh, air horns and things like that. Do you record your own sounds? Uh I would assume maybe you do is have a some sound engineers go out and record all these things, or do you rely on somebody else for that? No, we we do all of that. We have the state of the art recording devices, and when we go out and and do our recordings, we actually contract with the railroad to gain access to the equipment. 
and we mic the equipment up. So we mount microphones in various places around the locomotive to get the full essence of what that locomotive sounds like and put it into the recordings. Um, as opposed to walking around in a field with a microphone on a stick, you know, trampling through the weeds, walking next to the locomotive, hoping to hear what we want to hear, we actually can work with the engineers and say, okay, let's go notch one and then give me 30 seconds in notch one. Then let's notch up to notch two and then 30 seconds into notch two and so forth. And we may do that four, five, six times depending and then work our way down the same way. And that way we can get enough samples that when our engineers go back to the lab, they can slice those audio files up in such a way that, uh, for example, when you hear an idle sound on a, on a diesel decoder, you're hearing about a second or a second and a half recording played over itself over and over and over again. And his job is to find those recordings where they match so that you and I will never hear that audio loop you and I will actually be believing that that's an idle, idling diesel engine. And then they have to make sure that those sounds match seamlessly with transitions from notch one to notch two, notch two loop, two to three, and, and work your way through that. And so it becomes a very long process. Usually a, a good engineer can usually do that in about a week. But it's, it's a lot of process, but we work with the railroads to gain the equipment access to make sure we get the right sounds. And you never had issues with some of the railroads getting on? They're all fairly cooperative? Um, it varies. Okay. Um, some, of the, some of the railroads will ask, like if we do a museum piece uh, that they have running, some of them will want donations. Others will say, oh, yeah, absolutely. We'll be happy to let you run this thing. Um, you know, working with some of the class ones are a little more tricky because, of course, every piece of equipment out there is designed to make money. Right. And okay. if they're sitting there playing around in the yard, running back and forth on a switch lead, that's not making them money. Yeah, so typically your sound, uh, you're looking over a day, a couple of days of sound recording in the field? Uh, usually it doesn't take that long. It just depends on on what the accessibility is. But usually we can do it in, in less than a day. Okay, so it doesn't take long to set up all the microphones and get all the sound you want then? For sure. No, we're, go ahead. I was just going to say, you're not looking for that much of the, each particular sound anyways, because like what would you, when you say idle and you're only hearing a second and a half or two seconds, how much of that would you record? Like five minutes so the guy can pick out the right. best three? Pretty much. Okay. No, about five minutes, five, ten minutes, just depends. Um, one of the last recordings I was out on, we were we ended up having to call to – we were at a museum and had to call to uh, rescue a train. So I just left the mic running. So we I probably had 30 minutes of idling on that particular recording trip. Adam, are you are you still awake, Adam? Yeah, um, I'm here. Attaboy. Can I take a two-minute pause really quickly? I have to attend uh, to uh, the facilities for a minute, if you don't mind. No, I'm afraid we can't. We'll, we'll throw some elevator music in. Yeah, we really don't have to, we really don't have time, George. You'll have to stay. Sorry about that, guys. I'll be right back. Apparently, he's not paying any attention to me. <laughs> Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. And you Let's all go, go to the, the lobby, lobby and have ourselves a free. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy. The chocolate bars and the candy. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby. What are you working on, Adam, while we've been doing all this talking? Uh, I've been weathering a few steam locomotives. Weathering them? Like as in with the, in the paint booth or by hand with some pastels? Pan, pan you got, pastels. You got the pan pastels going, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I'm a, I'm a paint guy. I've got a little teeny brush going out and, and painting streaks. Ammo by MIG? No, I'm still... Uh, these are... Model Master Enamels. Okay. All right. Ah, going old school. Yeah. I, that's what oh, I, there's I a mean. steam locomotive. <laughs> <laughs> ah. uh, so, Adam, so what size brush are you using? Oh, uh, this one here is a 10-0 round. Wow. I, and it, then I've got, this one's a number two flat that I've been, I've been switching off between. That'd probably be a pretty good half-hour podcast. Some put into an AML All Stars about brushes. Uh, what are what different brushes you use and stuff like that? Because I bet you a lot of people don't know anything about that. 
That's a good. You know, that's a good possibility. It is. I got a whole can. Got a whole can of brushes that I go to for all sorts of things. And we could get Ralphie Boy on here, and you could argue with him. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you're using the front side camera. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, we're we've... going to talk that. I got to get on there. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right. Is George back? I'm back. Uh, Your apologies for that. It was uh, becoming an issue. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could hear the. I could hear you starting to speed up in your. Yeah, in your well, yeah. You know what? I was thinking to myself, can he go faster? And apparently, he could. <laughs> he could. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, um, I had a good question before you had to take a break. We kept the show going without you. I hope you don't mind, George. No, that's fine. I understand. Okay. Um, I got a count. Actually, <laughs> in, the, in the Tour de France, they call that a pause naturel. Pause natural. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, there you go. And the guy just pulls over to the side of the road and has that. That's it. That's it. <laughs> Some, sometimes caught on camera as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when I'm riding. Well, I was having so much, I'm having so much fun. I didn't want to end it, but so I wanted to go ahead and do it. I'm good for a while longer. <laughs> um, Perfect. So I, I actually have a couple of questions that uh, some of the regular listeners uh, wrote down here. So I'm going to. I'm going to ask them to you, okay? Okay. Uh, so Chris, Bob from Wichita writes in. Yeah, Bob from <laughs> Wichita. This goes out to a lonely trucker in Nevada. <laughs> this goes out to a lonely <laughs> trucker in Kansas going across the prairie. Uh, so Chris Atkins, who's one of our regulars here on the old AML network, he's the guy that invented the fans page, uh, which were, are we thankful for that? Or are we, are we, uh, the tr- tr- maybe? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Uh, Chris, Incon- the polls are inconclusive, depending who you talk to. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Chris, I can yeah, I go ahead. I know Chris. Do you? Yeah, I knew him, but actually before I moved up to Durango, uh, his uh, Southside modelers were one of the layouts I went and operated on. Okay. All right. Uh, so we never even got into that. Uh, so Chris Atkins wants to know how many purple polo shirts does do you own? <laughs> the polo shirts, I'm going to say seven. All right. Long sleeve. Long sleeve button downs. I've actually got about seven more in the in the house, um, but I tend to like the polo shirts because I don't like. I'm not a big long sleeve person, so even in Springfield when it's cold, I'm still going to be in the short sleeves if I can do, if I can get away with it. Well, that must be a hockey thing because I'm exactly the same way. I I don't like long sleeves, and I'm always wearing short sleeves in the winter. And people are going, "What are you doing?" So long as I have a vest on, I'm good. And if I had a sweater vest, I'd be Chris Atkins. <laughs> there you go. Or Adam, yeah. Chris Adams. <laughs> Wrong or you could be Cyril Figgis. What, what's that? I said, or you could be Cyril Figgis. Yeah. Anybody? Nobody? Anybody? Who watches Archer? Nobody. Who? <laughs> Archer. What? what? Archer. Archer. Nothing. Yeah. All right. Never mind. Ar- 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 Archer, Archer Bunker and Edith? <laughs> uh, it's on no. a, a cartoon on Adult Swim. No, it's uh, uh, FX. I have no idea what you guys are talking about. <laughs> okay. Uh, Note to self. Yeah. Archer references. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I got I'm it. Yeah. Uh well of course you got it, Penelis. Uh, <laughs> uh Joshua Barton wants to know who is your favorite co host on the on uh, uh, uh Ken Pat <laughs> who uh, Joshua Barton wants to know who's your favorite co host on Ken Patterson? What's neat this week? Oh, let's see. Should I start something and say somebody else or no, I'm going to go with my buddy, Joshua Barton. He's a good buddy of mine. I like him. And uh, so he's, he's a good guy out there. Okay. Uh, Chris. And, and that's a good answer. Cause you'll get some good barbecue. When you go yeah, to the restaurant. exactly. Yeah. Heck yeah. Uh, Chris Stilson wants, it says who, what was the hardest locomotive sound file to get? I'm going to say probably one of the Jeevos. And the only reason is, is I'm going to tell a little bit of an anecdote here. Um, the, we actually have, uh, uh, I, I'm, hang on George. I'm sorry. We don't do anecdotes on the AML network. <laughs> All right. I'm going to tell a story. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. Um, we, we actually have multiple recordings of the Jeevo, uh, because the first time we were supposed to go do it, we were working with one of our OEM partners and, uh, our, uh, company president, uh, chief engineer, Steve was supposed to go out and fly out in the morning go get the recording and then was going to fly back in the evening because we were doing it out of Denver. And um, on the way to the airport, it was still wintry around here and he slipped and fell and broke his arm. 
So he couldn't go to the airport. So we called a, a, a friend of the company who had some audio equipment who happened to be free that day and was able to go make the recording happen. But when we got them back, we weren't totally happy with the recordings. And so we ended up having to go out and do it a second time. And this second time we ended up going to LA and, um, we recorded it out there. And so, um, that one's probably the more tricky one just because of the, the slip and fall. Um, there was another locomotive we did where the first time, uh, we got out there, the locomotive broke. They could run it in idle and they could notch it up, but they couldn't move it. And so therefore we couldn't record it under a load. And so we actually had to go back out a second time and record it. And they were gracious enough to say, well, I know you paid. Uh, it's broke. Um, next time you're in the area, we'll we'll be happy. We'll fire it up. And we'll get it moving for you. And And that was actually the one I was telling you about where we had to go do a rescue train for another locomotive. So that was actually... Um, you know, so there's been some of that. Um, I knew, I do know there's been some stories of lost microphones. Uh, there was one that um, we have a, a Economy for the UK. And when they were out on that recording trip, I wasn't on this one, but I heard about it afterward. Uh, they didn't realize the clearances in some of the tunnels. And so one of the uh, tunnels chopped the microphone off of the top of the stand. <laughs> so there's been some trials over the years. Um, I'm not privy to all the stories, but I'm sure there's some good ones out there. Um, yeah. UK has some real tight clearances. Uh, so, okay. I, I don't know if you want to tell us or if you even know, but when you say some of these museums want money to fire up their locomotive, like what kind of money are we talking? Like, like a grand it, it, it varies uh usually not that much but it's usually considered a donation to okay. the museum okay they still have to get people to come out and run the locomotive and then they have to do the safety equipment make sure um all of that's running at well and we're following rules and you know wearing our protective gear and stuff like that so it it varies um so i i, I don't know an average rate Excuse me, I don't know an average range, but I do know, you know, kind of ballpark, and I just won't really get into it too much, um, but it'll vary. All right. Uh, this is a question that I tested out on Adam earlier, and he had no idea what I was talking about, so I'll, now I'll try it out on you. Uh, and okay. Then, and somebody put a smiley face beside it, so I don't know, maybe it's just a goofy question. Uh, Josh Bowman says, is Soundtracks going to come out with a universal Wi-Fi based throttle in to optimize Tsunami 2 operations? Um, I will say that future projects under dis under development are not really up for discussion. Um, however, what I can do is take that co that comment there back to the engineers and let them chew on a little bit and find out if it's a project that we can do. Okay. Sh uh, sh did we make a mistake? Should we have had the engineers on the program instead? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> uh, um, all right. And last question is how it, uh, Jeff Brigham wants to know how is Blackstone doing? Blackstone is a little bit of a tricky situation. Um, we, nobody on the planet wants Blackstone products more than us. But what's happened is over the years, we've been partnering with a primary manufacturer. And over the years, they keep increasing their price a little bit here and a little bit there. And it got to the point where um, they started getting too, too outrageous. Uh, for example, you can look at our boxcar, for example. The very first run of the boxcar was a $35 car. The last run was a $69 car. Now, when you rerun a, a freight car, there's no tooling costs to amortize into the price. There's no engineering time to amortize into the price. Basically, shoot plastic, paint it, put it together, put it in a box and ship it. So if they're raising the prices that much to where I had to almost double the cost of the car in its, you know, say, I don't remember how many years from the very first one, but we'll say, for argument's sake, an eight-year lifespan, that's more than what can be going on with future projects. And so uh, there was also, there was a period of time where, uh, you know, we were getting asking just for rerun of trucks and they would keep increasing the price and they kept increasing the price here and there. And we got them to make some concessions when we redid the um, I'm trying to think of what it was. It was the flat car and the drop bottom gondolas. We did a, a run of those that we were able to back the price down a little bit from that seventy dollar price tag to 60. Uh, it was fifty nine ninety five. I think it was. So we were able to back it down a little bit. But 
then we started getting more re- at requests for reruns and the prices kept going up and we said we can't continue to do this. Well, the management has decided to look at, at trying to find another factory, somebody that we can either go to or use as leverage so we can get the prices back down, something like that. And, you know, I think there's a certain level of with trying to manage all of that, sound, the day-to-day operation of soundtracks, Blackstone is something that we're interested in, but it's actually another full-time position that we just don't have the manpower for right now. And so it tends to keep getting pushed down the road a little, a little bit. It's like, you know, waiting to try to find out, okay, we're, we're waiting for this quote. Well, the end of the day is here and I've got all the soundtrack stuff still on my desk. Well, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. And then the next thing you know, it's a year later. In the meantime, we had been working and designing the new Ks. Uh, so, I mean, it's not like it'd been ignored. It's just been working on the Ks and trying to haggle the prices became a discussion that nobody wanted to have happen and nobody wants to move the tooling because that becomes a whole nother massive project on its own because uh, moving the tooling, especially overseas, they don't have the same scruples we do here. And so when you come over and say, we're going to move the tooling, things suddenly are all damaged, broken, lost, whatever, because, well, if I'm not going to do it anymore, neither are these other people. And they'll just, they can do something as simple as, run a knife on the face of a, on the face of one of the parts and that mold is no good anymore. Um, so there's, there's a whole aspect of that. And so management's actually trying to make that more of a priority this year. Um, and we had some quotes back that were promising to be able to get some projects back in. Cause when we asked them, they finally came back and said, all right, let's talk quotes. And we asked them to run a quote for like a rerun of a K 27, for example, Again, no tooling, no amortization of engineering, anything like that. When we built them last time, we sold them at a retail price of $475. With the current per quote they gave us to rerun the locomotive would be about a twelve to $1,300 locomotive. So that kind of gives you an idea of the costs. And I will say that some of the cost factors, as far as what you guys see in the end user, we took some hits on some of the profit margins, knowing that those costs are starting to get out of control, but we wanted to keep the project going and we wanted to keep the brand alive. And so anyway, well, we have some of the quotes back from our factory over from some of these factories overseas that we're looking at. And we were waiting for a couple of them to come back after Chinese New Year. And we all kind of know what happened then. So we're still waiting for a few of those uh, quotes. And unfortunately, some of those factories are still not back to 100 percent here in the end of March. Um, They're still uh, operating about 30, 40 percent. And that may or may not be engineering department as well. So we're still trying to get quotes back. But I know management's antsy. I know I'm antsy to get product back on the shelf. and, And, you know, nobody on the planet wants it more than us. And I'll tell people nobody in the building wants it more than me because I'm the one traditionally answers this question. And as a salesperson and as a modeler myself, I want to be able to tell my fellow friends, yes, I do have it. Yes, it's coming. Yes, we're going to do that. And it's frustrating for me to have to say otherwise. So as it stands right now, we are still waiting for a couple of quotes to come back. We're hoping to get those hopefully within the next month so that we can make a decision. And then once that decision is made, then we have to start coordinating, but not just with the new factory, but with our own staff to be able to go over, inspect the tooling, make sure it's there, and then show up hopefully with an army of people to be able to then guard the, st- the tooling while it's being moved to protect it and keep it from being damaged. Once it's, Let's say all that goes perfect. Once it's moved, then comes the fact that they have to look at the tooling and make sure that it'll work on their machines. Um, are there adapters that need to be built or does it need to be modified in other ways? Like say, for example, new holes drilled for brackets, all those things have to be discussed too. So for argument's sake, if we were to decide uh, at the end of this month uh, the, that yes, we're going to move the tooling to, we're going to take it to this factory. We probably wouldn't have the tooling moved before August or September. And then comes the project of getting stuff in and usually a, running a project is about a two to three month process because you have to pick road numbers, paint schemes, get liveries, and you have to go get samples of all of that, make sure they're building them correctly, especially in a new factory. And that's probably another three months. So I would say you're pro- we're probably still realistically a year away from getting any new product back on the shelf, which is frustrating. But I can tell you from the inside, we are working to get there. It's just unfortunately not as easy a path as everybody would like. 
And uh, and uh, Adam, you can help. You, you well, you can jump in on this one, Adam. Like, uh, oh yeah, I can jump in big time. I, I can tell you right now that if there was anybody that wanted a, well, let's just say that your K twenty eight, the K twenty eight is a perfect example. I'm probably one of the few that, uh, or many, I might be the right behind you and as being excited of getting that locomotive because multiple reasons. First of all. I would pay $1,200 for it, uh, and the reason is is there is not a K27. There's only one manufacturer in brass that has produced the K27 correctly, and those go for almost $2,000 right now. Uh, the uh, Every other K27 out there that has been produced from the very first K20, or K28, excuse me, the very first K28 came out in 1954 um, by PFM. And I just so happen to have the pilot, that exact pilot model is in my collection. The, uh, and ever since then, they've built, they've been built to a K36 standard. So they're too big. They're too tall. Mm-hmm. The boilers are too big. They got down, they got down to a point in the early eighties when precision scale bought out, uh, West side. And then that was the closest they ever became or the closest they ever produced to being correct. And then uh, Division Point, when Division Point just released them a few years back, oh, oh, 10 years ago, they were they were pretty much dead on, but they're extremely limited and very expensive. So uh, when that K20, when that K28 comes out, I will be definitely getting more than I probably should. But um, if you do need any help uh, in, with security, I'd be I'd love to help you go move that stuff. Yeah. Well, I can't think of a better guy to be uh, signing up for that position. <laughs> but, you know, but what I will say as far as cost, I know you'd pay $1,200 for one, but would you pay $1,200 for four? I'd buy eight. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fair, fair enough. But that's one of the factors because when we look at these mo- these uh, business models for doing mass produced models, and this goes for anybody, whether it be Bachman, Athern, Atlas, whoever – you know, they're, these mass produced models are sold at the cost they are because they're selling th- several thousand of them. And you get to a point where a cost, uh, ver- a cost versus quantity limit hits over. That's beautiful. That's um, me. <laughs> which one sitting in, sitting or hanging out the end? No, nah, that's me in the cab. Okay. What are we talking about now? Me? What are we, what are we, are you guys sharing pictures or something? Yeah, it's online. Sure. Just look at your screen. Yeah, well, don't do that because this is an audio podcast and other people can't see it. So I'll I'll share it. Well, who are you so, going to share but, it to? The people that are listening to the audio podcast. Yeah, as soon as it's po- as soon as this is posted, I'll throw it on the <laughs> on the fans page. You'll forget by then. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> but but anyway, that's where we have to look at se- selling several thousand of them. So if you look at like, for example, the first run of K-28s and, and K-36s had five part numbers announced um, in various uh, road numbers and, and paint schemes. We're hoping that most people buy at least three or four of them, if not all five, because you have to, you know, when you're amortizing five part numbers over several thousand units, it, you need to sell a lot of them. And the problem is, is that, uh, you know, even when we were getting to that 475, 500 range with our uh, plastery run of the K-27 and the C-19s, um, we were having people saying, Ooh, maybe I can't buy all of them. I'll buy a couple of them instead of three or four. And right. so that's where we have to be a little conscious of price because, you know, if you price yourself out of the market, yeah, division point, you know, you talk about their $2,000, but they're also only building several hundred. Right. And that, and, and that's, that's, that's very true, you know, and like, like I said, I'm probably one of the few people out there that, you know, really don't care and will spend whatever I need to, to get the best quality model out there. I mean, and today is a very different time period than, you know, I mean, everybody expects the best for the cheapest. And I, I totally understand the, uh, the the business aspect of it, but uh, it's uh, it's definitely a very needed model. And yep, I, I agree. And Blackstone, when it first came out, I remember people were like, it ran so well. People were just going crazy for this stuff. I, I wish I would have jumped back to HON3 when it came back, seeing as how I, I just did jump to HON3. I, uh, I've i spent way too much money on stuff that I should have been able to get it more, of, you know, because of they're harder to get now. And so I've spent more money than I should have trying to get it, but I'm grateful that I do have it. Um, yeah. 
I'll, I'll tell you, honestly, Blackstone converted me to actually look at narrow gauge stuff before I'd never really looked at it. Um, partially because I really believed it was a true craftsman scale that you had to sit there and build every building uh, board by board, every piece of equipment, you know, board by board and things like that. And then when you were done, they didn't run very well. And so it was like, well, what's right. the fun in this? But and, and what's stone, funny. Go ahead. Go ahead. OK, I'll go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> go, all right. Go ahead, Adam. I, I was going to say that, that that I mean, the very true statement with HUN3 is it's never really ran that good. And it's 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 always been hard. It's always looked amazing, but it just never really ran that good, no matter how hard you tried. And in, nothing's really changed, even though, I mean, it's 2020. Nothing really changed in HON3 since 1990, except Blackstone. And when I first jumped into HON3, I swore up and down that I, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it the old school way. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to make it work, and I'm going to make it run. And I think I built a couple couple box car kits and I said, you know what? I'm buying Blackstone freight cars. There's no question. <laughs> I'm, I'm done doing this. I, I got, I need to spend more time on my locomotives. And, uh, that's when I ended up, uh, buying a whole bunch of, uh, Blackstone cars. I got lucky. I found a little honey hole of them and, uh, picked up, I think I picked up 50 from one guy and another 30 from another, but oh, wow. I even called, I called, I called George. I called you right before I made that purchase saying, Hey man, <laughs> tell me what I need to know. Uh, before I spend a bunch of money and he said, he, he made me super confident in my purchase and I've loved every cent that I spent getting that stuff. My wife didn't, but, yeah. uh, but that's fine. No, that's another story. Well, will, that's a completely different will, story. And I was going to say, I will tell you from the inside, it's tough because seeing the models, uh, going through the design process and, and seeing all of that, it really difficult not to switch to HUN3. I probably go through it about every, I'd say probably 12, eight, 12 months, maybe a year and a half before I think, you know, maybe I just sell all my standard gauge stuff and go narrow gauge. But part of it's because I see it every day. I get to go out and see the yeah. trains. And so there's that certain level of, you know, you know, I get to see it. And so you want to go home and play with the real things. And I know I'm real good friends with a lot of the operators on the railroad. We go operate a couple of layouts, mine and, and a couple others in town. And, um, I really have an affinity for it. And Blackstone's one of the reasons because you're right. Why put all that work into something and it's not going to run well? You know, being an operator wanting to run our trains, that's one of the benefits of our hobby is when we're done building our model, we get to play with it now. Yeah. Um, so that that aspect of it really does help, uh, you know, or makes me want to change every so often. But then I go and I look at all the boxes of stuff I've got ready for that big White River route layout. And it's like, yep, no, I'm not changing. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> So how how many layouts are there in Durango to operate on? Well, in my group, there I guess I should say there was three in my little group, so to speak. Um, now one of them actually had to, his his wife's job moved him back to Chicago, so he's able to do his job remotely, and he's in Chicago now. But between him and I, um, we go and operate on each other's layout. But he works with the uh, uh, Durango and Silverton arm of their company called Rail Events. And so half the year he's traveled, especially for uh, towards the end of the year with Polar Express. Um, so when you see a railroad named Polar Express or a, an excursion train named the Polar Express, they're going through this this wing. They, they sell the rights to use that name. If you see Santa Train, they're not using the rights. But he's traveling all over the country to kind of supervise and make sure they're doing it right by paying for that licensing. They're not just half, you know, putting a half effort into it. So we don't get to get together as often, but I will tell you, if you guys are on the uh, Narrow Gauge Gazette and read that magazine, his art, his uh, White Pass and Yukon layout was uh, featured in there uh, several times last year. So I just... And then... Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I just clicked on the uh, raileventsinc.com. I didn't even know this thing existed. So this, yeah. So a guy had a job. He worked in Durango, and that was his job, was organizing this rail, for working for this rail events company. He, he's one of them. He's he's primarily an audio guy who would go in and, and like set up the speaker systems in the cars because they would actually play like you're watching the movie. But it would be real life. They have paid actors, you know, part of the uh, actors uh, union that come out and perform in the cars and they have to make sure 
that the cars are done right, the audio plays well, and there's no bad seat in the house. And then they have the actors come through and dress up as like, say, for example, the chefs and do the hot chocolate. And they'll play that hot chocolate song as they go through and hand out hot chocolate to all the kids in the car. Wow. The hot cho- so, that's what, really do a, that's go what ahead. We, I'm sorry. Well, that's what we need is something like the hot chocolate song. Uh, all right, uh, George, um, this is my last question, and then we'll wrap this puppy up. Uh, and we'll have you on again, of course. Um, okay. Uh, uh, depending on how soon it takes you to get me that hat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. It's uh, give me your ad- send me your address, and I'm going to send you one. I'm not giving you my address. You'll show up at my house. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> <there are> first- <laughs> um so uh, it, this hobby of rail, of model railroading, rail fanning, interest in trains, it's it's way bigger than anybody realizes, is it not? I think so. I think it's... And that's kind of... Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I think it's massive. You go ahead. Well, and and I think it is massive. And that's why I say I think it's growing, but in different ways. Because, you know, it's so hard. Like, the, the train shows nowadays don't seem to be as, as getting as much attendance. I mean, you look at, uh, what was it, that uh, World's Greatest Hobby, you know, years ago in Philadelphia drew 40,000 people. And now they come back through there and get about 20 to 25. And I don't think it's because people are not interested. I think the world of the Internet allows people to see the announcements instantly without having to go to the, to the shows and walk around. Um, you know, I mean, like I said, we do have an older uh, generation that's you know primarily interested in it. Um, we were at one show in Indianapolis, the national show, and we, we stayed at a hotel off uh, near the, near the convention center and walked, but the parking in that, in that convention center was terrible. Um, I'm sorry, I take that back. That was in, in uh, Cleveland and the parking was terrible. And some of the people were parked and they were in the parking spot and walking to it. And they said, well, where's the show? And they said, oh, well, you got to go down to this building two you know, two blocks down and over. And they turned around and said, well, no, screw it. We're going home. And you know, so there's a certain level of, you know, getting up and walking around all day long. Um, I mean, I'm 46 and it tires me out just standing there all day and talking to people, let alone walking around and trying to see everything in the day. Um, and so I think there's a different aspect of it. And that's why I say I don't think it's I think it's bigger than people realize, because there are a lot of those modelers that are there behind the scenes or hiding or behind their keyboard uh, looking at this stuff. And that's why the YouTube and Facebook and stuff like that are so important when it comes to marketing is so that you can reach those individuals and still be able to sell them the product. I mean, that's what we're all about is trying to make sure you're aware of what, what our product does. And if they're not coming to the shows, we have to reach them in different ways. And, and I think there's groups out there. Cause I mean, I've gone and done uh, clinics. It's like some of the clubs and I was actually shocked to see as many 20 somethings there as I did. And they out one club. I remember they outnumbered the older guys, and that was fantastic. But the, you know, then there the, were. Excuse me. Let me try to say that again. Then we went out to the show that weekend, and I never saw any of them. So there's a level of that I think is out there. So I do think it's a lot bigger than people realize. Um, it is the biggest hobby based on like the HMA, the Hobby Manufacturers Association. They've done uh, studies to kind of get a gauge on how big the hobby is. And model railroading is bigger than RC cars um, and airplanes individually. So there is that to look at. Who Who is that that did that? Uh, that those studies? The HMA, it's Hobby Manufacturers Association. Okay. All right. And how long ago do you think they did those studies? I want to say the last time I saw one was a couple of years ago. Okay. So don't I don't I don't know remember how long, but I mean time flies. I can't believe it's already the end of March. So exactly. Well, this hobby's way bigger than anybody realizes. Like way bigger. I as far I'm can like in all the years I've been in it, this this podcast has opened up so much to me. I I don't think we have any idea if we can figure out how to reach everybody. Well, it's like I said, the different. I've said this before. I feel like it's like. You know, we're coming out of a, there's been a nuclear blast and we're coming out of our basements convinced we're going to be the only ones alive. And like all the model railroaders are coming out of their basement going, what happened? You know, like there's we're so many of us that were never connected before. We were already self-isolating. <laughs> yep. All right. That's it. We're done. I've had enough of you tonight, George. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, uh, uh. Bruce, can you give out our email address? Slightly. Our email address 
Mother's Life, Mothers with one L, Mother's Life at gmail.com. So please drop us a line. Let us know what you thought about this. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, let us know. We can probably get back to George on that and see if we can answer those. Uh, so, yeah. And if you know anything about Vox uh, microphones, drop us a line. <laughs> Voice activated microphones. That drives me nuts. If one thing is I've become uh, from doing this podcast is voice activated microphones. Oh, my God. Um, but this went very well tonight, Big George, because you spoke up and you enunciated. So it will, it's going to sound great. Uh, well, we- thank you. And I apologize for not having one. I'd be honest. I don't do a whole lot of podcasts. So maybe it's time for me to just, you know, pony up and invest in one. Well, you know what? And I think I'm going to start. I uh, did an interview with... Uh, a couple of people where they use their phone and I'm beginning to think the quality of phones is improving so much that we're going to be able to have more and more people where they just use their phone. And, uh, cause I don't think those, uh, those microphones are voice activated for starters. Um, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. I, I've got a couple of them on my phone. And so I think that works as well. I think it does. Uh, you've been on other podcasts. Um, well I did, uh, one for, uh, TSG Multimedia, the guys out in California, and of course I've been done a couple with Patterson. Oh, of course, absolutely. Uh, you did so, you did that on your phone? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, uh, and we have a website, amodelerslife.com. If you go there, you're going to see all kinds of cool stuff, including stuff about our Patreon channel. That's what I never talked about when I was doing the was happening things. Uh, was not talking about the Patreon channel. I got to talk about that more often. Uh, do you know what the Patreon channel is, George? I don't know. Okay. I would, well, why don't you tell him, Lionel? You, why don't I tell him, eh? Uh, so, George, we have uh, one free podcast every week on Mondays. And then on Tuesdays, if you like the podcast so much, for $5 a month, you can sign up and get four more podcasts a month. And we started that a couple of years ago. So that's how people support the podcast. So there you go. Okay. Okay. Uh just- and- can I throw in a little self-promotion here? Absolutely. For, uh, sound- Absolutely. So if anybody wants to know more about Soundtracks, you can go to our website, soundtracks.com. Um, you'll find a lot of things like our user's guide. I mentioned the webinars on there. There's a link directly to them on our website. You can watch them right there. Um, also, go to you could, there's a link directly to our YouTube channel and Facebook. Uh, if you guys aren't following us there, like I said, we do post videos every week. Uh, so make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel and like our Facebook page. What's the most exciting thing that's happening at Soundtracks right now? Right now? Um, well, we've got some some things coming up uh, before long. Uh, one of the biggest things that we're getting to announce this weekend, uh, March 28th, is we are now the official two-time winner of Model Railroader Reader's Choice Award winner for Favorite Sound Decoder. 2019 and 2020, uh, we won Favorite Sound Decoder with wow. our Tsunami 2. Oh, okay. So that's from Model Railroader. Yes, Model Railroader Magazine did their Reader's Choice Awards, and uh, we are two-time winners. So wow. I'm pretty proud of that. Um, it definitely goes to show, uh, says a lot for the quality of the product, the reliability, and the features of it, quite frankly, because we've got some stiff competition out there. I've never said the other companies make bad products. I just know ours is better, and this kind of is a tip into the wind to say, yes, you're right, that is better product. Yeah, we were watching. Oh, uh, how many decoders do you sell in a year? Uh, a lot. Is okay. it? Uh, is it more <laughs> more than one and less than a thousand? Uh, probably more than both of those. Uh, more than a thousand and less than a hundred thousand. That's probably fair. Okay, well, it's somewhere in there. Um, and did you notice when you were on our show, you weren't you weren't forced to be on the show with another uh, decoder manufacturer? I did notice <laughs> that, and I appreciate the, uh, the respect. <laughs> All right. As, do we have anything else, guys, or are we done? I think we're done, are we not? I think we're done. Well, you know, you know what? We're not done because George could be, we could easily well, we're do almost. An, we're almost done. We could yeah. easily do another episode with George. Uh, yes. Uh, so we're going to work on that, George. We're going to work on getting you back on here. Uh, hey, might, anytime. Uh, you might I'm ha- having a lot of fun. You're having fun? Absolutely. Oh, oh wow. You know what we got to do is send him one of those official AML headsets, and then we'll be off to the races. There you go. That's right. I, th- I think I think he needs the Kelly questions. Yeah, well, I was wondering. Okay, let's have a, a straw poll. Uh, 
Uh, should we do the Kelly questions with this microphone setup that he's got, or should we wait and do it another time? Uh, probably do it with this one. Uh, okay, that's one in favor. Kaylee? Let's wait, let's wait and do it another time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm- Actually, I kind of lean leaning in that. I know he sounds great now, but imagine how much better he can sound. Yeah, that's right, Adam. Oh, so you don't want to do it, George? Oh, I don't care either way. I'm game. Okay. Well, I thought. Okay, uh, Adam. It was my idea. All right. So you're in favor. <laughs> so how how opposed are, are you to it, Kaylee? Right now, are you like really opposed? You'd rather not. Uh, where are you where are you sitting right at this moment? Because you know what, I Kaylee is a you know what? I'm sorry to tell you two guys, but I I feel that Kaylee's welfare is more important to me than your the either Bruce's or Adams. Okay, you know I I'm just looking to realize what the time is now too because we you started later. I was just thinking the same thing honestly because you guys are a lot farther east than I am. Oh yeah, and I go to bed so early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and honestly, if you hang on to it. It gives people a reason to tune back in. Uh, you have never listened to this podcast, have you, George? <laughs> <laughs> Most of them only listen to the first 10 minutes and then they give up. Yeah. And they come back for another 10 minutes and then give up. Yeah. I, and then they got hooked. Yeah. Okay. Let's get down to brass tacks here, George. Have you ever listened to our podcast? Be honest. I have listened. Be honest. I have, I have listened to most of two broadcasts uh, driving between towns when I was on a road trip. Okay. And how long ago was that? The most recent one was in January. Okay. And what, so what did you, okay. So you're a two time listener. What do you think of it? Well, I'm here, aren't I? <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's a good, that's, Great, a good that's, a, that's a good answer. That is a good answer. All right. So I mean, if I, didn't, if I didn't like it, I wouldn't be here. Okay. All right. Okay. That's a good answer. Don't suck up now. You don't want, you don't want to overdo it. <laughs> <laughs> save it for the Kelly questions. Yeah. Yeah. Save it for the next interview and the Kelly questions. Uh, All right. So, Man, I can't stand these Vox operator. Uh, uh, this is going to turn out good. Trust me. You're going to be happy with the end result. I feel, feel very confident because you spoke up and enunciated. So I know that the end result is going to be really good. Trust me. Uh, uh, don't take my uh, on-air angst as anything other than just... I feel the same way as when I had to turn back and give the hat back. That's where I'm at. <laughs> 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 Well, there was some part well, of there was some part earlier in the show when you said something about tuning up. Somebody said something about tuning up, and I thought, well, no, there's a hockey expression I haven't heard for a few years, for a while, is or, or from my playing days. You're sitting on the bench, and and uh, something happens during the play, and you turn to the guy beside you on the bench, and you say, "Next time I go out, I'm tuning that guy up." <laughs> uh, I've never heard. That. You never heard that? No, I've never heard that. Well, maybe it's a Canadian thing. Have you ever heard that, Adam, where you say to yourself or you say to somebody, I'm going to tune that guy up? I've heard it a few times. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> uh, all right. So we have a website, modelerslife.com. Go there, discover about Patreon. Sign up to Patreon. You're going to be much happier if you do. And, George, at the very end of this, uh, we have you have to say you have to say happy rails to you. At the appropriate moment. All right. Are you ready? Not I think so. Okay. So happy rails to you, and you'll know when that is. So get ready. All right. Get ready, because it's the most important part of the show. Well, George, as we close the barn doors on another episode of A Modeler's Life, and the sun slowly sets over the back 40, I guess there's nothing else left to do except for you to say... Happy rails to you. Busted Knuckle, guests of a Modeler's Life podcast, stay at the Casa del Sol, Motocorton Inn, where late night dancing at the Rumba Room is a magical event to be experienced. It's another Lincoln Homer.
Thank you.